the ministry. By ministry here, we're not using ministry in this kind of wide service sense that gets used. You hear, you'll get this kind of thing. Um, it was really cool for a while to do this. Church bulletins where you would have the listing of the, the people and would say, pastor, um, so-and-so, or I don't know, sometimes player, coach, or something really cool, and have the guy's name. Then they would put ministers, and the, it would be all the members of St. Paul's. Something like that. You know, the idea that everybody's in ministry, everybody's got this job to do. That's a fine idea. But when we're talking about the ministry, we're not talking about the priesthood of all believers. We're not talking about everybody's responsibility to proclaim the gospel, everybody's responsibility to be sharing Christ, everybody's responsibility to be faithful in his vocation. That's not what we're talking about. The ministry, we're talking about specifically, we, talk, we call it the office of the holy ministry. That's what we're talking about. And the office of the holy ministry in our circles now, by definition, is what we call the pastor. That's it. Now, I should admit up front that this whole topic is just quite convoluted in our circles right now. And this is not an easy thing to sort out because we've got lots of different currents of thought going on. And I will try to introduce you to a few of the currents of thought and some of the concerns that are here in a very cursory sort of way because we can't possibly unpack this whole thing. And then you will discover to your chagrin that this topic will get brought up in classes and kind of hinted around and talked about, but you're not going to deal with this again for quite a while because it just where it comes in the sequence of things. So you'll, you'll be having this. What will also happen almost inevitably is that as you make your way through your seminary career, you will start to form more and more opinions about this, and you'll probably find yourself kind of settling into one of the other views of this thing. But always be careful to kind of know there's a wider and a kind of a hot issue on this thing. It's not quite as clean as some people want you to think it is. Having said that, let's talk about this a little bit. So the office of the holy ministry, the office of pastor, where does it come from? That's the big problem. That's precisely where a lot of the rub starts. Because in a sense, and this is grossly oversimplified, and I know that, but it just give you an idea to kind of where to hang this thing. There are two ways of sort of looking at this. One is to say, the office arises from, there you go. Ah, I heard both of them at once. This is so perfect. I couldn't have planned it better. All right. One quick answer is to say, the office arrives from God. He establishes it. It is his office. So God establishes the office. Why do we have pastors? Because God wants us to. What does St. Paul give the counsel in the, in the epistles? Choose, you know, a pastor. Establish a pastor. He puts pastors in each place. Pastors are chosen by God. God's decision. This is God's plan. So it is coming from God. It's a divine institution. <laughs> this is really important. Now, is that so? Is it a divine institution? Yeah, it is. God establishes this. He chooses St. Paul for the task. He puts people in the position. Timothy is chosen by God for the task. So we have this concept of it being a divine institution, <clears throat> and our confessions reflect this. This is how our confessions work. Augsburg Confession, Article 1, 2, 3, are dealing with God and with sin and just basic stuff like that. Article 4, you get to justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Article 5 talks about good works. Where do those fit? Then Article 6 talks about how does this gospel, this good news, get delivered? And Article 6 is all about the office of the ministry. So the, the principle is very simple. God has this gospel, and he delivers it to us through this office of the ministry. So the office of the ministry is dealing in the means of grace. That's why we say all the time it's the office of word and sacrament. A word and sacrament ministry. What we mean by that is a means of grace ministry. We are here to be doing the means of grace. Which means also then that the pastor is, by definition, he is the absolution man.
He's the absolution man. Might make a good superhero. You know? Absolution man. That's what he does. The pastor gets to stand in front of people and say, I forgive you your sins. Te absolvo. I forgive you. And so that's what he does. This is his calling. This is his task. This is his one unique role he gets to play. Nobody else gets to do this. The president of the United States does not get to be absolution man. He cannot forgive sins. Well, unless he's part of the priesthood of all believers, but he can't do it in the same way the pastor can. The pastor gets to stand in front of the congregation and say, I forgive you your sins. Why? Because as a called and ordained servant of the word, and in the stead of my Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you the forgiveness of your sins. He's put there by Christ himself. Okay? Called and ordained servant of the word. So, this is one aspect of this. There's another way you can answer the question. What is the source of the holy ministry? Yeah. The congregation. Okay? The congregation is the source. And in this view say that the congregation is the source. The idea is that who has the office of the keys? To whom is given the power to forgive and retain sins? The saints. The to the saints. Okay? So the office of the keys, that's what we mean by that. Office of the keys means the power to forgive and retain sins. Okay? So who has the office of the keys? The saints do. And more importantly, the whole church does. So do you have the office of the keys given to you? Yes. That's why you can forgive your brother. That's why you can do it. That's why you don't have to send him to a pastor. So the, the idea runs this way. If the office of the keys is given to the whole church, that means anybody has the authority to stand up and forgive sins. Everybody has the responsibility to proclaim Christ. Everybody has the ability to go right to God himself. That's all true. And so... The other side of this is that the office of the pastor is derived from the congregation or the community of believers. So the community of believers is the source of the office. In this train of thought, the pastor has authority. Why? Because the congregation vests him with that authority. So the authority for the pastor derives from the congregation. Authority is given to the pastor. So it works this way. A guy comes into the congregation. What gives him legitimacy so that he can stand up in front of the church and preach? It is his call. That's why we make a big point about as a called and ordained servant of the word. He's called. The call of the congregation gives him the authority he needs. So that now, because the congregation has given him this authority, he is speaking to the congregation on God's behalf. So the congregation is clearly involved here in this whole thing. So, which one is it? Yeah, it's both. It really is. But the, which one you emphasize will shape a lot of how you, how you kind of function. If you tend to emphasize strongly that God is the one who establishes, you can kind of begin to slide off into a sort of, um, as we like to say derisively, a hair pastor sort of attitude. Here I am. I am the pastor. I'm the one who calls the shots because God put me here, and everybody else is shut up because you're just peons. That attitude's not real good. Every once in a while you hear of stories where someone is kind of doing that. I've heard stories. I don't know if they're true or not. But I hear that maybe that happens. All right? So that's one side of it. The other side of it is that, hey, I'm just like you, and I'm no different than any of you, and I just happen to get kind of stuck into this job, and we're all in this thing together here, and I'm nothing special about me. That's dumb and wrong, too. All right? Because the fact is, the pastor is someone special. He is God's absolution man, and he does have a responsibility to be speaking on behalf of God. He's not like just everybody else. There's a difference. It is. And yet, his authority is not somehow inherent. You see, this is one of the, the big deals here. When God ordains somebody and puts him into the holy ministry, he becomes pastor. And we use this word ordain. We'll talk about that in a minute. So when a guy becomes a pastor, what happens to him? Is he somehow given an indelible imprint? Now, I've got it. <laughs> oh, 
feel the power, you know, willing through me, you know. And now, here I am, absolution man, because the words have happened. Or the magic hands have been put upon me, and the power of all the pastors in my circuit have been imbued into me. I am it. Absolution man has arrived. The DP has said the words. All right? Yeah, yeah, you go into the sacristy normal, you come out, absolution man. That's how it works. And, and the key is in the stole. That's where the power is, you see? Only the absolution man gets to wear the stole. All right. So this, this concept, though, is out there, and you have this sort of idea of an indelible character that once you're in the office, you're stamped with some kind of character, and it goes with you wherever you go. This is how Rome looks at it. The Roman Catholic Church understands that when a priest becomes a priest, he has now been given a special kind of, they call it, an indelible character. And he's got it. He's got to set him aside. And now he is priest. It doesn't matter if he is serving a parish or not, he's still a priest. No matter what he does, he's a priest. This is why the Catholic Church is in such a dilemma over this whole sex abuse thing. Because the world around wants the church to be defrocking, defrocking all these guys and throwing them out of the priesthood. And the church says, what do you mean? We can't do that. They're a priest to priest to priest. And that's why the Catholic Church will take these bad priests and they shuttle them off into some kind of back room somewhere to some kind of retreat center or put them in a monastery or try to shelve them somewhere until they die. But they don't want to defrock them. They're really reluctant to do that. And it's rare to hear about one of these guys actually being defrocked because how do you, it's sort of like decommissioning, you know, how do you do that? How do you make him un an unpriest? It just doesn't fit their understanding because once you've been stamped, you've been stamped. That's the way it works. We don't see it that way. We don't understand it that way. We understand that what God does is God uses the congregation and the priesthood of believers, they call this pastor, and the call is the key thing here. Because he has a call, now he has the authority. In the Lutheran church, and I would argue, and this is getting now, here we are starting into the little debatey stuff, and there are views on this where things start to diverge, and even what I'm giving you up here, people are going to dispute this, and if someone else is standing up here, they'd be giving you a different spiel. I'm trying to be balanced. I do my best. All right? But, I would argue that it is the call that makes the pastor. And so when a guy does not have a call to a congregation, he is not really a pastor. He's still seminary trained. He's still reverend because reverend is the title he has earned by his MDiv. He gets to stick MDiv behind his name so he gets the title reverend. But reverend does not mean pastor. Pastor means called to a congregation. And it is on behalf of that congregation that he carries out his authority. And like I said, this gets sticky and gets rather convoluted. And this is hotly being debated in our church right now. We have not figured this thing out. We've been debating this for about 150 years and really haven't come to terms with it yet, trying to sort this thing out. And one of the reasons why we haven't come to terms, I think, is because Scripture does talk both of these ways and gives us both of them. And this kind of is a funny thing. So the pastor's authority derives from the congregation, but is he now beholden to the congregation? No. No. You see, is he hired by the congregation? No. No. Pastor's not a hireling. He's not hired by the congregation. He's got a call. See, this is the beauty of our understanding of the pastoral ministry in the Lutheran Church. It's complicated, makes for some problems, but it's a cool thing. Because once I, as a pastor, receive a call from a congregation, and I accept that call, and I go to that congregation, and I'm installed as their pastor... Now, whose pastor am I? God's pastor. And what do I speak? God's word to those people. Do I have to worry about how the people are going to respond? Well, as a good pastor, I will. But you see, if I have a majority of that congregation that doesn't want me to talk about giving or tithing, and I know that God has called me to be faithful and talk about these things, what am I going to do? I'm going to do it. And if that congregation doesn't like me, can they fire me? No, not in a correct understanding of the Lutheran polity. Unfortunately, we have some congregations that are sliding away from this, which is a sad thing. But see, the power of the Lutheran of the call is, how do you rescind a call? You only have two 
reasons for taking a call away from a pastor. One is false doctrine. The other one is an immoral life. The fact that he's offensive doesn't count. The fact that he steps on toes doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's a, no, it's a very good thing. Because, you see, that's, that's why you see you have this kind of twofold thing. Yeah, the congregation calls you, and you're a called pastor, and that, that's where your authority derives. But once given that authority, you're God's pastor, and you speak God's word to those people, and you are not worrying about, do people like this? Or are they going to fire me? See, that's a big difference between like a Baptist understanding. In the Baptist congregational nature, congregation hires its pastor and fires its pastor for whatever they feel like it. You're our servants. In the Lutheran understanding, the pastor is not there to serve the whims of the people. He is there to lead those people in God's ways. And so you, it's kind of like, you say, well, it seems like it's sort of at cross purposes. Yeah, that's part of it. And I really think maybe that this is one of the greatest struggles for us as Lutherans, and it creates real difficulties for us, but I think it's also one of the strengths of how we do this. And it creates real opportunities for us. And it's a very cool thing. So I don't get to just run around being pastor because I'm ordained. I get to do anything I want. No, I still am responsible to the congregation. And the office of the keys then is not given to me as a pastor. Now I've got the office of the keys, and I can get to run around and give them to whoever I want. No, the office of the keys belongs to the whole congregation. I am exercising them publicly on behalf of the congregation. And that's why we call this the public ministry. Public does not just mean it happens on Sunday morning in front of everybody. Even if I'm doing counseling one-on-one, -on -one, I'm still exercising the public ministry because what this means is I am carrying out the ministry of this congregation on behalf of and in the name of this congregation. And that's part of the difference then between the priesthood of all believers and the public ministry. In the priesthood of all believers, when you are forgiving sins, you're not doing it in the name of the congregation. You're doing it in the name of Christ because you are Christ's child, and you can do that thing because of the priesthood of all believers. The pastor is doing it on behalf of and in the name of the congregation because they're the ones who have vested him with that authority. That is also, though, functioning at God's behest, doing things the way God wants it to be done. So in a very real sense, position one reminds us that the pastor is not beholden to the priesthood of all believers, and I agree with that. But position two reminds us that he serves because of the authority that is given there. That's true as well. Like I said, they, it's hard to reconcile these, but I really do believe they're both scriptural and both accurate. Okay, John. You said there were <coughs> two reasons that a pastor could be dismissed. It was living an immoral life, I think. And yeah, immoral behavior and false doctrine. Okay. Uh, what if the pastor... I get confused when you said beholden, because obviously even in a called position you have responsibility to the congregation. If you don't show up at work, well, you're not living an immoral life, and you're not, you're not preaching false doctrine, but you're not doing your job. Well, either. no, yeah, you'd be, you'd be, if you're not showing up at work, that's negligent. You're not doing your task, and that would be immoral. That would be I'll failure. I mean, morality. sure, okay. sure. You're not, I mean, not, but if I preach, you know, offensively, that's, that doesn't count. That, uh, that's hardly grounds. And you see churches, though, they're kind of scrambling around trying to figure out how to get rid of pastors. Now, there are creative ways to get rid of a pastor. And you don't have to take his call away from him. You can just cut his salary. And <laughs> you can do that. So there are, there are plenty of creative things you can do as a congregation if you really want to play dirty. And you can do it and still meet the spirit of, wow, he still has his call. Or you haven't taken his call away from him. But you can sure make his life miserable and drive him out. And congregations are sometimes very good at doing that. Yeah, Todd. Um, it might be simplifying it, but someone explained it to me as the uh, pastor, as the shepherd, and Colt refers to it too, is that the sheep might don't dictate to the shepherd. <coughs> that's right. How he directs things. That's right. The shepherd may whack a sheep to get him back into the pen. That's right. But he, that's his job. That's and right. You know, he has to care for the needs that's of right. the sheep. That's right. And he does it in, in the right way. That's right. But he's also a shepherd only because there are sheep, in a sense. And, you know, and he... And he is there to care for them as well. Kolb does a nice job of kind of portraying the kind of humble attitude you need to have as you approach this. And that's the key thing here. There needs to be a real humility on the part of the pastor and on the part of the people. And the congregation tends to really like this aspect of it. 
Pastors tend to zero in on this aspect of it. They both need to be there. The pastor needs to have a spirit of humility. I'm here to be your servant. Sometimes it calls me to do hard things, but I'm here because I love you and I care about you. And the congregation needs to be there to say, we want you to be our pastor and we want you to lead in the right ways. Do it. And we support you in this. We trust you in this. That's the right kind of attitude. And we need to cultivate that attitude a lot more instead of kind of adversarial where the pastor is trying to protect his turf, the congregation is trying to protect their turf. And that's really a bad news thing, but that happens too. You have congregations, well, we've been around here 100 plus years and no pastor's going to come in and change us. You know, we'll be here long after you leave. That attitude isn't healthy, and who, no one benefits from that. But also nobody benefits from the pastor coming in and playing here at Pastor. I'm the pastor. This is the way it's going to be. It's my way or the highway. That doesn't help anybody either. You're not benefiting. This p- creates a nice tension, which is healthy. But see, I think we need to be careful we don't drop the ball on either side of this thing. Because if you go too far here, you elevate the office of the pastor so high that people feel they have nothing to do, insignificant, no role. That's a bad thing. On the other hand, you have the people who kind of, well, I'm just like you, I'm just your coach kind of thing, and he's not a pastor, he's just Joe and everybody. And you get the Pastor Fred kind of thing going, and you know, he's all he's the buddy kind of thing. Now, I think that really hurts the office. And for quite a while in our church body, that was the move that we were going. And this is also sometimes known as a, a functional view, that what makes him a pastor? Well, he's doing pastor things. It's just a functional thing. Anybody can do it. And whoever, whoever's functioning as pastor this week, he's, he's the pastor. That sort of a functional view really degrades the office and takes away from it because the office is a sacred institution. and it is, You are God's man when you're in this office, and you need to realize that. And I, I guess I would say, quite frankly, this is hard for some guys. Some guys want to be the buddy and the pal and just one of the guys, and they have this tendency to sort of diminish the office intentionally. I think that's unfortunate because when you become a pastor, you're a pastor, and that may put you in a different realm. Read First Timothy 3. What are the criteria for being a pastor? It's different than it is for being a Christian. You know, God doesn't require husband of one wife, hus- household in order, you know, able to teach. That's not a requirement for being a Christian. There are none. But a pastor has those criteria. It's different. And so that's where we also run into trouble on this where, you know, this guy's a great guy. He should be a pastor. Just not every great guy should be a pastor. There are criteria. There are, you, know, you need to meet certain re- obligations and, and, and standards because you have a role to play, which is very significant. So, in other words, I'm really encouraging you to be pastor to people and realize that means you can't be buddy. And sometimes that even means you can't have real tight friends within your own congregation. I know that sounds like heresy, but it's pretty hard to be real close friends with people in your congregation if you're also responsible for calling them to task and being there for them in tough situations and all that kind of thing. It gets hard. It's just the way it is in ministry. It seems like it would also be really hard to have family members in your own congregation. (coughs) It can be. And that can make it challenging because you've got to be pastor to them at the same time as your family to them. And that can, that can be tough. I've been in that situation. And, I, I'll, yeah, it's not the easiest thing. But um, that can be done as well. It's just you've got to be conscious of it. And so that's probably the biggest thing. Just be conscious of who you are. I'm not saying you, don't, you can't go hang out with people in your congregation. But you always need to be conscious of who you are. You are pastor. Yeah, you're Joel and you are a person. But you're pastor. And that's part of that vocation thing. You're living in lots of different things. And you need to realize that you are a pastor to those people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't take off the pastor hat and put on the here I am playing around hat now. It doesn't work that way. You're pastor all the time, but you're yourself all the time. And so you need to realize that in, every, in any interaction I have within this parish, I need to do it as the pastor because I have a responsibility to be there for them. So I can be the kind of guy that someone will come to when he is in the crisis in his marriage and he can trust me to handle this the right way because who he knows I am, that kind of stuff. So you're right, it, it makes for some challenges. Tom? You know, there, 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 I keep hearing there's a, a shortage of availability of pastors. Mm-hmm. And you know, so when you look at uh, the congregations, do the, the congregations just designate somebody then to, to, to perform duties in the church as opposed to there's not a call there, it's just a, you know, okay, you know, you're it. Uh, type yeah, how does that work? And that's part of the debate we're having right now. This is the whole kind of issue. What, is it, what do you need to be to be a pastor? What does it mean to be called? What you're describing, I would say, they're calling him to be their pastor. 
The problem is the pastor who they're calling, this guy, probably doesn't have the credentials, hasn't really been trained, doesn't, isn't prepared for this task, so maybe he shouldn't be. So that's part of the question. See, the, the other big part of this debate is how much training do you have to have to be a pastor? Do you need an MDiv to be a pastor? Well, we've decided, no, you don't. You can have a certificate. Well, you need to go to the SEM to be a pastor. Well, that's uh, you're being argued now, too. You know, we have this whole delta thing going, you know, the distance to education leading to ordination. And then you have lay pastors. Well, what's it mean to be a lay pastor? How much, you know, your situation in Alaska? Are you being a pastor when you're doing word and sacrament ministry? One camp would say, absolutely, you are. Another camp would say, no, because you don't have the training and you're not ordained. And see, this gets, it's not an easy thing. And what you, should, what you should be getting out of this is this gets really complicated really quick. And people start fighting for turf like crazy on this, and the, and the battle really heats up. And it's, it's, you'll see soon enough, this gets rather testy. Well, and, and, and I do notice it's, it's almost like they, 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 they put, uh, you know, almost assign different levels of pastorness to you, you know. Oh, like yeah. You sure. talk about MDiv versus certificate versus yeah. Delto. Sure. Uh, well, and we can even go STM or, you know. You know, the, yeah, you sure, you can go up and go down as well. Yeah. And, yeah, you're right. I tend to be one of these kinds of guys who would say, if you are called to carry out the task, you are a pastor. And that's, can, that's where I'm coming down on this increasingly. I don't think pastor gets to, is defined by your education or by your training. I really believe it's defined by the call that God puts you in. You are a pastor. Now, Am I ready then to throw open the doors? Not at all, because I think there's also a great value in the training and helping people to be good pastors. And so, but we've got to s figure out how to balance that too, the education thing. It's not an easy thing. So, and this is maybe a side note we can talk about later, but you know, when you look at the certificate versus the MDiv type program, mm -hmm. you know, when you complete the coursework for mm -hmm. your certificate, what do they call you? They call you pastor because you're called. Well, but if you're not called yet, I mean, it's, you know, because we're making that decision. Oh, they call you a vicar. You're a vicar for a year. But see, you're still a student at that point. I think it's complicated. Okay. Well, that's the, see, that's the funny thing about our, our certificate program. Is you go out, in, after your, your two years here, you go out your third year as a vicar, but it's what we call a convertible vicarage. And so you get placed in the congregation and you are their vicar under the supervision of a pastor who knows how involved in your ministry and you start carrying out your ministry and then a year later you graduate from the from the seminary or you get your, your certificate and you are certified to be a pastor and then you get ordained and you get installed and you go into the pulpit the next Sunday and do the same thing you were doing the Sunday before you know and so yeah it's 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 a little bit odd no doubt about it at before I looked at the seminary was uh, lay minister certification mm -hmm. and it's two to four years of education mm -hmm. not so many credit hours however you look at it mm -hmm. but at the end of it you can receive a call mm -hmm. to assist the pastor mm -hmm. or in some situations to function as a pastor in some remote Alaskan Montana area or something yeah or nobody wants to go <laughs> or actually everybody wants to go but nobody can get there everybody wants to be in Alaska all right, only, only a few are chosen. Yeah. All right, um, auxiliary offices then. How many offices are established in Scripture? Only the office of the ministry. So the office of the holy ministry is established. The office of teacher or deaconess or deacon or lay minister, all of these really are auxiliary offices supportive of the office of the ministry. The office of the ministry's job is word and sacrament, means of grace. It's a means of grace ministry. And these auxiliary offices then assist the, uh, the accomplishment of these offices. And again here, we're into touchy territory. And people get real funny about this when they start fighting for turf. Well, I'm an office too. I'm a legitimate called office from God. And this is what God has established. But if you look at scripture, you have to come to the conclusion that the office of the ministry is established. And the other ones are all underneath this one. Um, let's see. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you start looking at, like, DCEs and things like that that come up through that program, those are called positions also. Yeah, right. Can they be considered auxiliary? Yeah. yeah, they still are. And see, this gets really, it's very complicated because now the left-hand realm intrudes, and you have things like um, 
tax law and all kinds of stuff that is different for pastors or called servants of the word than it is for non-called people. And so the IRS will define a minister of the gospel differently than we do, and so you get all these kinds of funny things. So like a DCE or even a Lutheran school teacher who has a call will have to, is considered in a sense, a minister of the gospel by the IRS and can get all the tax breaks, if you want to call them, that a pastor gets, but then also have, you know, it's just it's a funny thing, you know. We have our understanding. So we have a theological issue, which is trying to sort out the theology of this, but then you have a whole political, legal, sociological issue, which is a different animal altogether, and they're both going on. And so that's why when you call the synod for advice on this, it kind of depends on who you're talking to. And the synod tends to look at it more from a left-hand polity sort of a thing, whereas around here at the seminary, we tend to look at it more as a theological thing, and what's the theology behind it, but both of them matter, and it gets confusing. So we call DCEs, and that's fine, they're called for this task, but now the IRS steps in and says, well, then you're just like a pastor, no different in our eyes. In our mind, well, that's a big difference. John? Um, I've met a bunch of pastors who don't, never really received a call from a congregation, but they wear the clerical, they're ordained, they work as pastors. Like, for instance, a pastor in our congregation heads up Life Path Hospice at home. I worked with four pastors at the county jail who were chaplains there and conducted services regularly in the jail. Uh, the call the call didn't really <coughs> come from, I mean, one of my friends who works in the jail is not only an ordained pastor, but he's a detective also. Mm. Um, that, but he wasn't, I don't I don't know if he was called exactly. He works. He he's a deputy. He's the sheriff's department. Hmm. Um, you you get a lot of you know situations where you maybe have kind of strange arrangements worked out in, in different situations. We also have the the uh, the rather odd way of doing things where we have institutions who are also able to call. So a con technically, a congregation is what makes a pastor calls them. But my call is to a seminary. So the seminary board of regents have given me my call to be a professor. So it's kind of an odd sort of a thing. And you can even have a, a district calling a pastor to be a, a, minister, a, pa a missionary starting a, con a congregation. Is he a pastor? Yeah, the district has called him. Well, I see, that's another thing we argue about. Can a district really call? Is it really a congregation? Not really. And so, see, we get all these kinds of really lively discussions about all this. What well, makes thing with missionary work to go create a congregation yeah, or something? Yeah, right. So when, what, whose authority do you do that? You know, I, I know some, some areas where you'll have a mother church will call the man and then send him to be a pastor. That probably makes better theological sense and fits better with our polity than an institution doing it. But then others say, let's not get so hung up on this. We, know, we all know what we're talking about <laughs> and we have survived this far, this long doing it. But Again, this is just more evidence for my contention that this is not a clear issue in our Senate at all. There's all kinds of debate about what really is going on, how we're to understand this. And you would get a whole other take on this if you talked to a DP for a little while. He would give you another a district president in, our, you know, in, in one of our Senate's districts, and he'll give you a different take on the whole thing from his perspective. All right, so pastor then is functioning on God's behalf and functioning on behalf of the congregation. What is it that makes the power for the pastor? It's always the same thing. It's the word. Because God has called him to proclaim the word. The word is what empowers his ministry, and the word is what also gives the congregation a strength. Because the, the um, office of the keys has been given to the church. They have that authority as well. Um, yeah, okay. I'm making sure I don't leave any details out here. Women ordination. We have 10 minutes. That's just enough time. Um, probably, probably nine minutes too long. We don't believe in it. That's for many good reasons. Um, and we don't express those reasons very well all the time. Bottom line reason why we don't ordain women, I would argue, is because God has built into his creation a certain design or order. And in that order, there is a distinction between men and women. And that's how God wants it, especially in the Christian home. And in the church, we reflect that. And in the wider society, we should also reflect that. And to be respectful of that is doing, way, doing it the way God wants it. And to go ahead and ordain women is to flaunt and negate what God has established and act like it doesn't matter. 
And so the issue of ordination of women has nothing to do with qualifications or skills or abilities or capabilities, nothing to do with it. It has to do with being faithful to the way God has put the universe or the world together and doing things his way. So there's my one minute. Questions on that? How do other, how do other denominations... Other denominations make the move of saying, Galatians 3.28 says, there is no male nor female, Jew nor Greek, all we are all one in Christ. Therefore, these things have been negated. And my response to that is to say, that's right. Vertical relationship before God, we are all one. There is no difference. All equally under God's judgment, all equally under his gospel, great. But in the left-hand realm, in this world, how we still function, there are still clearly distinctions. Men and women aren't the same. Different responsibilities, different roles, and in the church, we respect that and we reflect that, as we should. And I would even make the argument that we should also respect that and reflect that in the wider society. But right now, our wider society would hear none of that, but I do believe that's also the case. Okay, Jeremy? All right. <laughs> You've been waiting. <laughs> um, all right, so my senior pastor is a man. Why can't my assistant pastor be a woman? The because man the head. No, because she's still carrying out the responsibilities of the pastor and is functioning as pastor and an assistant, you know, so he's the head, fine, but don't call her a pastor then. She should be, she could be functioning in a, in a capacity of, you know, serving, helping, assisting the work, not a pastor, because it creates all kinds of confusion in the minds of people. Women and handing out communion. All right. The... Validity of the sacrament has nothing to do with who does it. So can a woman hand out communion? Distribute might be a better way to, you know, just sounds better. So, well, we had a big discussion. Yeah, so can a woman distribute communion? Yes, she can distribute the sacrament, and it doesn't negate the sacrament. And she can do that even in a submissive way. However, and this is the big however, I would say that in just about every instance of a woman helping with communion that I have heard of, usually it's because there's some kind of an agenda going on where the congregation is sort of pushing the envelope a little bit and doesn't like the position of no women's ordination and is doing everything it can to sort of undo it because I haven't heard of a situation yet where you have a congregation we just don't have any men available the woman had to do it that is not the case it's, it's, an, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a motive of trying to empower and this kind of stuff and I would say it's a bogus motive and does it create confusion I would argue it certainly does because in the minds of the people, they say, oh, look, isn't that nice? She's doing stuff the pastor does. She's being like a pastor. I guess that's kind of nice. I wonder why women can't be pastors. That's exactly why they're doing it. Isn't that basically what the CTCR document says? The CTCR document, and I will go on tape and on record saying this, everybody out there in TV land, I think the CTCR document, especially the most recent one, is lame. <laughs> okay? I really do. I think it blew it. Because the CTCR is reflecting an increasing attitude in our synod of trying to be accommodating, trying to be in step with the rest of the world, and we are neglecting the whole order of creation, the, the design of creation. And the latest, this, you can watch this progression, the CTCR documents on women in the church. It used to be that was the central argument. Now that has just kind of got shunted off, and we don't talk about that very much. And now, what we've got in our synod now is a situation where, why don't we have women pastors? Well, the Bible tells us we shouldn't, and that's the only reason why we do it. So they can do anything else up to that point. And so we start just playing these games. Can't you do this? Can't you do this? Can't you do this? And we're missing the whole point of it. The whole point is God has established this wonderful order, a man and a woman functioning together in a marriage, and the church should reflect that, and we should be supporting that and embracing that. But instead, we have just left that behind because we're embarrassed by it, and the world doesn't like it, and so we just kind of leave it behind, and we act like it's not there, and we're now in the business of trying to empower everybody. And we're coming up with a lot of stupid policy and a lot of stupid practice, and I find it quite reprehensible. And to be honest, I didn't have this position always. I, I, I didn't come to this position easily. I used to be kind of, you know, yes, the has got it right. This is fine. This is cool. You should do anything but being a pastor. And I've changed my mind on that entirely based on the study I've done on it. And I was kind of forced into it because last last quarter I was teaching a class on this. And the more I dug into this, the more I read about it. Man, it's just overwhelming. It's all about the design, God's order of creation. And to ignore that is really to be, I would say, to be unfaithful. And I think in our church body right now, we are not being as faithful as we should be on this issue. And we will pay the price. I would even go so far as to say this, that given the current trajectory, it's only a matter of time before we're considering ordination of women. Given the current trajectory, because of the path we've set out for ourselves, it's the wrong one. 
Yeah, I completely agree with you, but as a pastor, if you're called to a congregation that's very liberal and is doing all this second guessing and all mm-hmm. that, should it be your goal as the good shepherd to try to force them to stop? Force? I mean, that's confusing. That's not a bad word. You know, I think. Um, well, see, again, what is your task? Your task is to bring God's truth to them, and if they're in error, you need to bring it, point it out. Is it the best way to do that, to you know, stand up your first Sunday and go on record and lay that throw on the gauntlet? Probably not. Just yeah. Edu- you educate, educate, educate. You spend years getting them. You teach them. You walk them through the stuff. You do, an, you do an innocent Bible study on Genesis. You talk about creation. And you really dig into this. And you start really teaching God's design. Or you do a Bible study on merit. And you start really teaching this stuff. And if people start saying, well, that's what God really says. Then they start thinking, they put two and two together. Huh. Maybe this has implications. You see, that's the way you do it. You do it gently. You take your time. And you might have to bite back and swallow hard for a while on some stuff that's going on. There are some things you're going to be able to just have to say, no, that just can't happen. And you have to be judicious about those and, be, and try to pick them carefully. But um, that's part of being a pastor, being diplomatic and being deft about it. And the wise pastor knows how to be humble about it and how to be God's man, the absolution guy, while also serving that congregation, respecting that congregation who has given him that call, and doing it carefully. It's an idiot who walks in the congregation and says, here it is, my way or the highway. And you hear those stories. Maybe they're true. I hear the stories. But that's stupid. You're not serving anybody by that. It's also equally stupid just to kind of roll over and say, well, that's what the congregation wants. No. It's it's different than that. But, see, you can be pretty sharp about how you go about this. Educate. Let's just, hey, how about we all just study this together? And so you start teaching it to your elders and to your church council, and then to a Bible class. Before you know it, you got people who start thinking that way. And then the real delight happens in ministry when you're at a voters meeting, you've got some hot topic coming up, and you got a certain direction you think it should be going. And you're just sitting in the back, you don't have to say a thing because you've got other people who are already on board doing it for you. And somebody stands up and says, I think it should be this way. And then you just smile and say, we've done, the, we've done it. You see, and that's, what, that's the task that you want. You want to be the one who doesn't have to lead the charge because you've taught other people why they should be leading the charge. No, you've answered my question. Okay. <coughs> I know this is a little bit of pastoral theology stuff, but I can't help it. <laughs> Jeremy. What's the class that you taught on this? The class I taught was called Man and Woman in Christ. Is it going to be taught again? Yeah, I think so. It's part of the deaconess curriculum. And so you might get a chance, but forget it. You won't be, as a first year, you don't get to take it. You have to <laughs> burn your wings. John. Um, you read something from Titus about husband of only one wife. Yeah, Timothy. Okay. It's in Second Timothy. The, the, First Timothy 3. The question comes up then, I know like rabbis have to be married I yeah. guess, or they can't continue to be a yeah. rabbi and Catholic priests can't be married at all. Yeah. I, I don't understand where all that comes from. Yeah, the um, Catholic priest is where Paul said it's better not to be married because you can devote yourself. And so the Catholics decided a long time ago, that's the best, we'll just make it mandatory. And they've paid the price for that ever since. Now, that wasn't from the very beginning. That came in later. And, and there are many, even in the Catholic Church, who are advocating we need to start letting priests get married for lots of reasons. And I, I'm, I think they're exactly right. They need to. But that's neither here nor there. So far as the rabbis, you have to be married. Well, that's part of their culture as well. The question, what does it mean to husband, what does husband and one wife mean? That's a very interesting issue. The exegetes have, you know, toyed with that and done some work on that. But some people say one wife at a time, you know, and I don't think that's really what it means. It means husband of one wife. And it raises some interesting questions for divorce and remarriage and fit for the fitness for the office, all kinds of stuff. And I tend to think we've also gotten a little bit lax in our practice in that area. 